Hello and welcome to Eye on Africa, France 24's program focused on the continent. I'm Charlie James and these are the headlines. Children in the Democratic Republic of Congo learning how to protect themselves from the deadly Ebola virus. France 24 takes you inside one school where Ebola prevention is an everyday lesson. Madagascar installs a senior UN official as its new prime minister. The former prime minister stepped down earlier on Monday in a bid to end the island nation's political crisis. And the humanitarian situation in South Sudan continues to deteriorate. The UN's emergency relief chief says people there are suffering on an almost unimaginable scale. And we begin with the fight to contain the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In a country where much of the population doesn't believe the virus is real, schools have become a front line for prevention. France 24's Thomas Nicolon shows us how children are being educated on the dangers of Ebola. At this primary school in Bandaka, pupils have to wash their hands and get their temperature taken before class. Each morning, they start the day by singing the Ebola Go Away song. Since the outbreak isn't contained yet, teaching staff have an important part to play in raising awareness. This sickness kills. It's everywhere. So what can we do? Well, we need to tell the children. We need to tell them how to prevent Ebola. It's important that we do this because otherwise children would disappear. And who will remain in this world? The children understand the message. I have to wash my hands every time to avoid the sickness and I can't shake people's hands. Because if I do and they have the virus, they can pass it on to me. The teachers explain this to us. It is vital that young children become aware of how dangerous Ebola is, especially because many people still deny the existence of the virus. In Bandaka's marketplace, bushmeat, which potentially carries the virus, is handled without precautions. I'm not afraid of Ebola. It's all fake. I've never seen anyone die from it. As is common in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the church is the only voice people trust. Across the whole Equator province, priests beg believers to be careful and respect basic hygiene rules. As a pastor, I'm a leader too. We're fighting against this illness because the church is part of society. The church must warn its Christians. We deliver the words of God while telling them about good hygiene. With the help of those who raise awareness among the population and with the medical measures being taken in the field, the worst-case scenario could well be avoided in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In a bid to ease the political crisis that began in April, Madagascar's Prime Minister, Olivier Mahfali, resigned Monday. The country's president has already appointed a new head of government. Maud Julien has the story. Olivier Mafali's resignation might be a first step towards ending the deadlock in Madagascar. And he wasn't given much of a choice. The Constitutional High Court told him he had until Tuesday to step down. I fully accept the Constitutional Court's advice. Such is my patriotic duty. I would like to show my readiness to resolve the current crisis. I resign willingly and happily to allow the president to freely choose a consensus prime minister. The man who will replace him is Christian Tsai, a former minister of labor and until recently a senior UN official. He'll be tasked with selecting a team of ministers that mirrors the results of the 2013 parliamentary elections. That poses a problem, though. Many MPs have changed political camps since the vote, and now both the ruling party and the opposition claim they have the majority of seats. So it's unlikely the nomination will be enough to stem the crisis in Madagascar, which started in April when protests erupted against several new electoral laws. The opposition claims the laws favor those in power on the eve of a general election. 
five years of civil war in South Sudan has left over seven million people in need of humanitarian aid. That's more than half the country's population. The world's newest nation is also the most dangerous place to be an aid worker, with 100 having lost their lives there in the past five years. Now, the United Nations top aid coordinator, Mark Lowcock, has called on major powers to step up sanctions on South Sudanese leaders. He says doing this would pressure them to the negotiating table. Lowcock recently returned from South Sudan and joined us earlier on the program to explain why he believes sanctions will help the humanitarian crisis. Well, the central problem, the reason why, as he just said, most people, the majority of the population in South Sudan are in need of humanitarian assistance is because they've been victims of violence and the men with guns since this war began more than five years ago. And uh, there have been uh, peace talks. The regional countries have made heroic efforts to get all the warring parties around the table and there have been a series of uh, agreements to cease hostilities, but none of them have been kept to. And that's why the Security Council, as you say, last week decided that new measures needed to be explored. Because, unfortunately, it seems to be the case that the suffering of the people of South Sudan is not a real consideration for the uh, belligerents, the men with guns. And so, somehow... Something different needs to happen. Pressure needs to be brought to bear so that um, people get back around the negotiating table in a serious way. Now, there have been kidnappings, murders, attacks on UN civilian protection sites, but still aid workers remain in South Sudan. At some point, does it just become too dangerous to keep your staff there? Well, the UN is determined to stay and deliver, and... Uh, We've been reaching more than 3 million people with food and medical services and water together with the Red Cross and the NGOs and lots of other agencies. So um, people are willing to um, take enormous risks to reduce the suffering of other people. Um, but the situation continues to deteriorate and um, somehow more pressure needs to be brought to bear so that... Uh, you know, people can have a chance to rebuild their livelihoods and uh, have a bit of peace and security. That's Mark Lowcock, the UN's emergency relief coordinator. Ivory Coast's president has announced he may seek re-election in 2020, despite already being elected to the maximum of two terms. Alassane Watera says the nation's new constitution, adopted two years ago, allows him to extend his power. Previously, Watera has said several times that he would step down after completing his second term. France 24's Leanne de Bassampierre sent us this report from Abidjan. The news has made the front page of all the major newspapers today. President Alassane Ouattara may seek a third term when Ivorians go to the polls in 2020. While he hasn't thrown his hat into the ring just yet, on the streets of Abidjan, the reaction has been mixed. I think that if he runs again, it will be like 2011 or 2002 all over again. So I disagree with it. The country is quiet now, so if he can reassure us it will continue like this. He can run again, and we will support him. He can run again because the new constitution allows for it. They voted for it. He said he would only stay two terms. He should leave when he's supposed to. Running for a third term is dishonest on his part. Despite being halfway through his second term in office, Watara claims that the new constitution adopted in 2016 resets the counter and allows him to run for a third term in 2020 and a possible fourth term after that. This view is not, however, shared by the opposition. The president knows that running for a third or fourth term is unconstitutional and unacceptable. It won't be possible because most Ivorians will not accept two more terms. So I'll refocus the debate. Our debate today is limited to the conditions of the elections. We want them to be transparent and credible so that there is a peaceful transition. The interview comes as President Alassane Ouattara tries to unify the current coalition into a single party ahead of the 2020 polls. 
following a series of deadly attacks by local rebels, Africa's oldest national park has announced it will remain closed to visitors until 2019. Virunga National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo is home to a world-famous population of mountain gorillas, but has been hit by rising instability and violence in the country. In April, six staffers were killed in an ambush. Then in May, a ranger was killed and two British tourists abducted by a local militia. The park was initially set to reopen Monday, but the closure was extended to allow a thorough review of security precautions. And finally, ending now with some football news. Despite his shoulder injury, Mohamed Salah has been named in Egypt's 23-man World Cup squad. The Premier League's top scorer, the Liverpool forward, almost single-handedly led Egypt to its first World Cup since 1990. Salah was hurt during the Champions League final last month. His necessary recovery time is uncertain, but it is doubtful he will play in the team's opening match against Uruguay on June 14th. That's all for this edition, but do stay with us here on France 24. There's more news coming up shortly.